Hello, it's uh, Carl Ritz here. Well, we had a little bit of a problem with the recording at the beginning of the PAN meeting. So Josie asked me if I'd be amenable to re-record the introductory presentation I gave. And of course, I'm very happy to do that. So with appropriate clicking, if I can make this work and we can get the PowerPoint slides onto screen, then you should now have a nice clean uh, image of the, of the PowerPoint slides. So I'm the, uh, the warm-up act for the evening, and um, I'm going to introduce soil biology to you with an especial emphasis on fungi, given the theme of the meeting. And in order to do that, we are going to have to go underground. Um, this is just to remind me that this needs to be a lightning flash presentation because we don't have very long, but there's a huge amount to cover. So I'll be missing and glossing over various aspects, and of course, always happy to pick those up in the Q&A session um, now, or feel free to get in touch in the future as well if uh, any aspects uh, strike you. So straight to topic, uh, soil biota, the amount of living material that one finds below ground. This varies from about five to 100 tonnes per hectare of living material below ground. The low end being a heavily uh, a heavy industrial arable system, the other end being uh, permanent pasture. Uh, five tonnes per hectare equates to about 100 sheep per hectare. So in the pasture, you're talking about 2,000 sheep per hectare. So there's always as much biomass of living material below ground as above ground. And I like to describe this, uh, this biota as the biological engine of the earth, because these organisms are involved in driving many of the key processes and functions that soils deliver. This is a very important concept. Soils do things, soils function, and the range of things they do are many and varied. Here's a schematic showing um, what we describe as ecosystem goods and services provided by soils. And you can see it's a, it's a long list there uh, involving all sorts of aspects. One that will spring to mind um, in the theme of today, this evening's presentation will be in relation to food supply and, and agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. But also remember that soils are involved in archaeology as a basis for heritage. They store water, they purify water, they provide a platform to live on, they're involved in nutrient cycling, regulation of gases and therefore climate and so on and so on. The, the, the key theme for um, this evening is going to be about a sort of subfunction called biotic regulation. And I'll talk about that a bit more um, in a minute. So here's some examples of the of, of um, soil biota. At the bottom is the earthworm, the iconic uh, organism that I hope you're all very familiar with. Um, here are some wee mites, and then um, go through the microbes such as bacteria, protozoa, uh, nematodes, and here's some fungi. And we'll be picking up fungi, of course. Um, the form of fungi that most people are familiar with is the the mushroom, um, but the mushroom is really just the reproductive structure of a particular subgroup of the kingdom of fungi called Basidiomycetes. Um, the vast majority of this organism lives below ground and uh, it looks like this. The, 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 the basic structural unit of a fungus is a filamentous tube that grows by a process of apical extension and periodic branching. So a little spore will germinate and produce a single tube that branches and grows and branches and grows and this then results in the formation of an interconnected network that, that, that fills space. And as, it, as the fungus grows, it absorbs nutrients from the environment and uses these to grow and branch and become um, larger and larger. This, this network is called a mycelium, plural mycelia. Um, so and here we see a mycelium of trichodoma viridae, um, which is, I'm sure we'll be hearing about that later because it's such an important biocontrol agent. So here's some real fungi growing in real soil. Um, on the left, the, the blue lines there are filaments of Rhizoctonia solani growing through the soil pores, which the lighter color there, the, the solid soil matrix is the, is the darker stuff. So you can see this, this growth form of the mycelium is well adapted to growing through a porous medium like soil. And that's much more clearly visible on the, the right-hand panel, which is a stereo microscope picture of some plant roots and fungal hyphae connecting those roots together. These are almost certainly mycorrhizal fungi. And again, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about those later. The other thing just to notice in this, in this image is this, again, how porous soils are at these microscopic scales. And again, stresses how effective these elongating branching networks, such as plant roots and fungal hyphae, um, are adapted to growing in such a porous medium. 
The other thing to stress is that these high feet and fungal mycelia are extremely delicate. So if you want to preserve your preserve fungi in your soil system, then you need to be handling with care and not disrupting that system too much because when the mycelia are broken and fragmented, they, are, they do not function quite so effectively. The other thing to stress in functional terms is that fungi are involved in, intimately involved in the majority of those functions we saw in the previous slide. But the only thing that fungi don't do is fix nitrogen. Only bacteria can do that. So let's just pick up where one function that I wanted to explore a bit with you, because I think it'll fit with the theme of the meeting well. And this is in relation to biodiversity and the attenuation of disease. I'm sure you're all familiar with the role of monoculture in providing a circumstance that's very prone to epidemic proportion disease. So industrial agriculture aspires to have a biodiversity of one in its fields, just one species of plant and nothing else, pristine. And then, of course, what this does is if there is an organism that's able to utilize or attack that crop, it will have a feeding frenzy because there's nothing really to stop it or curtail it. Now, in natural systems, uh, other organisms interact with these pathogens and start to, to control them, attenuate them in some way. So there's a key role of biodiversity in controlling disease in, in systems. And I did some experimental work a while ago um, asking this basic question of how does the presence of other organisms affect the ability of pathogens, um, and tonight we'll be talking specifically about fungi, to grow in soil. So here's a very simple experimental system that we used to explore this, explore this question, where we took two little aggregates of soil and put them inside a, a glass dish on a sitting on little bits of um, little bits of rubber. So they're isolated from each other and they're, they're spatially isolated one from the other. We sterilized these aggregates so there's no life in them at all and then introduced life into them in a controlled way, which allowed us to ask these questions. So what we did was on the left-hand aggregate, we, would, we added a pathogen, in this case, Fusarium oxysporum, fungus. And the question we asked was, how effectively can this pathogen colonize this other aggregate, depending on what the biological status of this other aggregate is? So we pre-colonized this other aggregate with other organisms, and then put the pathogen fungus on here and watched its ability to colonize. And being a, a filamentous organism, it can grow across the gaps between these uh, aggregates easily. And here it is, so Fusarium growing profusely on the, the left aggregate, on the right growing into this aggregate where there are other organisms that we've, we've manipulated into that system. So the, just a little bit of data then, the, graphs, um, the graph shows the ability of the fungus to colonize the adjacent aggregate. And the larger the number here, the more able it is to colonize. And this axis we're showing the, um, the other species of fungi on that, on that other aggregate, ranging from the sterile system, so no other organism there, through to a non-sterile system where there's a whole bunch of other organisms. So, you know, bacteria, other fungi, protozoa, nematodes, and all these, all these other things. So in the sterile system, the fungus is able to colonize with with a plum you know no, nothing resisting it so you get five units of of colonization um, in the non-sterile system where there's like a high biodiversity there then you're two or three orders of magnitude less able to, to colonize so the non-sterile aggregate can barely be colonized by the fusarium and then these all these numbers represent different sorts of other fungi that are um, that are in that adjacent aggregate so you'll see that this this there's a whole range of, of, of attenuation from not much difference to the sterile to equivalent to the non-sterile. So whilst this one has lots, this has lots of species in it, there's only one species of fungus and that, that's the equivalent uh, attenuation there. So the complete range of things. Now the, the, the trick here is that the aggregates that were being colonized that showed most resistance to being colonized by the pathogenic fusarium had been pre-colonized by other fusarium species. So what we see here is that there's a specific relationship between fungi of the same genus actually resisting the ability of the, the pathogenic fusarium to invade. Again, you know, normally you could use this as a means of screening potentially effective biocontrolled agents. What this tells us scientifically is that essentially the fusarium-shaped niche in these adjacent aggregates is being occupied by other fusaria 
that slows down the, the, the pathogenic fusarium um, to get in there. And here's an example, again, not now with individual species there, but just again, demonstrating the importance of biodiversity in and of itself in this phenomenon where we manipulated overall biodiversity in the natural aggregates rather than just putting individual species in. So the sterile system, again, sort of six units of, uh, of, in, of infection, the full biodiversity system showing three orders of magnitude less, and then we manipulated overall biodiversity to, to nominally a low and a high level. And you can see actually there's quite a clear relationship. So the more diverse the soil system is, the more prone it is to attenuating the growth of an individual organism. That could be actually that could either be a pathogen or it could be an organism that you might nominally say is also one that's desirable and you'd like in the system. So biodiversity plays a key regulating role in the behavior of individual organisms in the system. So to, um, to, to finish with then, um, I just want to give you my four headlines for, you know, you can see the importance of soil biology in, in, in soil systems and um, how one would manage soil systems to promote the soil biology in the best possible uh, manner. I've got four headlines around this and they, they re relate to fungi as much as sort of kind of any other biological component in the system. So the first thing is to avoid messing up the architecture. If you destroy soil structure by various means, this will interfere substantially with that biological engine and how it functions. You've already seen how it would, um, would mess up fungi by destroying mycelia. And there's all sorts of other reasons why it, it, it affects um, other organisms as well there. So you want to keep soils as intact as possible. And of course, this is the, the, the precept for min till or zero till and um, starts to tell us a bit about the, the mechanistic reasons for why that is an effective strategy. The other thing is to keep fueling this biological engine. So keep feeding the system with energy and nutrients. Essentially, that's plant material. Plant material and organic matter is fuel for the biological engine. Replace what you remove. That's the fundamental uh, law of sustainability. If you take something out of a system more than you replace it in time, that system will run down. That applies whether it's your bank account, your body, or your field. And finally, encourage and maintain diversity by whatever means you can, you can think of, um, because this, again, for, for many and varied reasons, in overall leads to increased resilience in the system. So those are the four basic tenets um, for managing soil fungi, but also managing the soil biota um, as a whole. And um, I think that's my time up. So thanks very much for your attention. And as I say, uh, look forward to the Q&A and do feel free to get in touch if you want to pick up any other aspects of this. So that was brilliant, Carl. Very to time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so I don't mind. see any question. I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but people might want to as we move along. But I think therefore we will allow people to have a think about those questions uh, and we will move to our next speaker uh, Tim Parton and Tim is a former soil farmer of the year and he's going to share his experience in making active use of beneficial soil fungi and regenerating soils on the 300 hectare farm at Braywood Park that he manages. So Tim's going to talk about uh, his pest management, disease management, crop nutrition, soil management, and how his methods have also helped boost biodiversity, uh, as well as make a huge cost savings because Tim is managing nature to work cost effectively for the business. So thanks and over to you. Thanks, Stephanie. Good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for giving me the chance to come and speak. I'm a farm manager in South Staffordshire um, at Brood Park Farm. It's a 300 hectare farm. Just to give you a quick rundown, I basically split the crop in, so I'm 50-50 winter spring cropping, um, growing milling wheats, winter oilseed rape, spring barley for malting, spring beans, spring lupins. Lupins is a fantastic soil improver, which I'm never going to get too rich out of them, but they are a fantastic soil improver um, and a brilliant protein source. And why we import so much soil when we could be growing lupins is always beyond me and one I always make a point of, of talking about. Um, I also grow spring goats, which normally go for, for mournflake for porridge oats. Um, I've got grass in the rotation, 
which is rotated around the farm. We're very close to Wolverhampton, so we've got a massive market for equine. So all the all the grass is made into haylage and uh, and and sold on like that. Um, grass again is a big improver for the soil moving around the farm. I am in the mid tier, so all our watercourses are protected. Um, and I love to put corridors in there, especially in the early days when I got going to, to get all my predators there so they could move around the farm freely and, and really start to work for me. Um, I am a direct driller uh, and I totally agree with what Carl just said. Fungi are so delicate, they do not want disturbing. And if you drop a big tillage implement in there, it's just like somebody putting a ball and chain through your house. And just as you start to build a few bricks back up, somebody puts a ball and chain through again and you're just depleting it all the while rather than trying to work with nature's finest helpers we're, we're always been pushing them back in my mind um just go oh hang on just going back to that one i, I don't use insecticides i haven't used insecticides for seven years um i don't use pre-emergence herbicides i don't use growth regulators um and i rarely use if if use at all fungicides I, i've managed to get away from using all those products, um, mainly because I try to farm as biologically as possible. Um, and I, I, I try to farm as nutritionally as possible. So I'm always trying to keep that plant balanced. If that plant is balanced and, and is photosynthesizing properly, I'm not going to get a pest attack because it's a healthy plant. It's not producing the sugars that those pests want to come in and eat. Um, and so I'm just not going to get a problem, which is why I can get away from not using insecticides. Insecticides, <laughs> they don't work anymore anyway in my mind and if you use an insecticide you'll take out some of the aphids you're trying to get but i guarantee you'll be taking out a lot of the predators and so you're just getting on that hamster wheel of always needing an insecticide because you've wiped out the natural predators so it's just a vicious hamster wheel that gets yeah. faster and faster and once you get off it there's no going you know just, I, I, I wouldn't even dream of using an insecticide anymore a big part of what I do is direct drilling. And so I've modified this 750A to, to, to allow me to do that. So I've got a tank on the back here, which I use for my biological brews, which we'll talk about in a minute. I've got a hopper on the front so I can do companion cropping um, and another hopper on the back so I can broadcast companion crops or I can broadcast fertilizer, whatever I want to do. Um, I've also got row cleaners on the drill, which came from Australia. I was having a problem with establishing all the seed rate because my combine doesn't spread the chaff that well. And I was getting an acid buildup just in that biosphere of the root zone, which was making my oilseed rape plants obviously go yellow and die. So by including those row cleaners, I've alleviated that problem. But the, the drill is, is sort of like the big part of the system. It's, it's my main tool, my main machine for doing what I'm doing. Um, and people often ask me, have I finished modifying the drill? I don't know. I modified the drill to be able to do what I want to do with it. Um, and putting biology down was, was a, a big part of that process, really. So that's my, my brewer. It's, it's quite simple. Um, it's just an air pump. It's a heat pump on the side. It's insulated to keep the heat in there. I brew up nitrogen fixing bacteria. The air is 78% N. It's ludicrous that we're not tapping into that, especially with the cost of nitrogen. So I'm trying to get the soil to fix as much N from the atmosphere as possible. I also brew up phosphorus releasing bacteria. I brew up pseudomonas and I also brew up trichoderma. Trichoderma is an aggressive fungi. So if I have got any fusarium on my seed, the trichoderma will go in and eat it for me. That's, that's the theory I use and it works, seems to work well for me. I, as I said, I don't use fungicides, so I've replaced, if I did need to use a fungicide, I've replaced that by brewing up Bacillus subtilis and Bacillus amyliquifacium. The amyliquifacium is like a stronger cousin of the Bacillus subtilis. Um, and in regard to fusarium, where I did trials sort of four years ago, where I used for the, I hadn't used the biological brew, I'd got 36% fusarium. Where I'd used the biological brew, I'd got 2% fusarium. And it just takes that fusarium out of the system because I'll always be using home safe seed. So that seed has, 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 has got the endophytes on it. So it's right to go into the biosphere on my farm. It's the right environment. And that plant will keep adapting in my mind to, to, to make its offspring even stronger, ready for that environment that I'm going to drill into. Hope that makes sense. I try to make compost on farm and I, I, I make different types of compost. But most of our soil is, is always biologically active. So I'm trying to make a, a fungal compost to, to get all those spores back in there. We've been killing everything for the last 70 years. 
um, and I'm trying to get that, that those fungal spores back in there. So I'll do a compost extract uh, from that compost. Which have I got a slide for that? Yeah, I have. So I'll make a compost slurry, um, which basically I'm applying about four, two to four kilos of, of compost per hectare. And I'll make that into a slurry um, and just filter out any big bits. And then that will go into the drill tank. I'll, um, and that will go down next to the seed in the seed trench. So hopefully straight away, we can start those interactions and start to get that protection and, and get that, that two-way balance sort of going where the plant will put out sugars, it will put out amino acids, it will put out carbohydrates to, to feed that fungi. Some fungi will become endophytes, so some will, will just feed um, externally. But it, it, the fungi has always been there. This process has been there for millions of years. It's us that's interrupted that process by starting to put synthetic chemicals on and just disturbing the whole process in my mind. And I class this century as probably being the, the biological century because we've exhausted the chemical century. We've got ourselves in a real mess with it. And it's time to readdress that problem and start to work with nature instead of against nature. Um, and I've had you know, really good success with doing that. But it all starts with a healthy soil and fungi is a big part of healthy soil. Um, and that's, that's my whole sort of ethos really is always keeping the soil at the center. It's we're farmers at the end of the day and the soil is our biggest asset. It's what makes us money. And without it, we're out of business. It's as simple as that. Sorry, everyone. I couldn't work that out where that was coming from. So I just muted everyone. So, Tim, if you just unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Well done, Joseph. Yeah. <laughs> Got me in mid flow there. Yeah, um, sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's, it's keeping that fungi active. That's why I grow an awful lot of cover crops. Uh, and by, by, by laying those down, that, that, the, the fungi will start to eat the lignin and break that and make all that nutrition available for the next crop. And that's why I'm always 50-50 with my spring to winter cropping. Um, I'm, I want to put that fungi food there to keep the whole system moving. You know, they, they fungi want to work for us. They want to be our friends. But we need to feed them and uh, that's one of the reasons i love having cover crops in cover crops do so much for us and uh, that that's one of the reasons that they're in the system with me so as i said it all starts with the seed so in my mind putting fungicides on seeds it just, it's just a, a stupid idea um a lot of people, you know, they chuck a, a seed dressing on, they haven't tested the seed, they don't know why they're doing it, um, and it costs a lot of money, so I don't put fungicides on the seeds, and I'll have it tested to make sure there's no nasties there, which there never is, or never has been so far, um, and so I've got those endophytes on that seed, as I said earlier, so that the plant has prepared that seed to go into the environment in which it's been grown, and I want to capitalise on that, and it's really important, you know, to let that crop senesce, because it's the, the endophytes only really go on the seed, as I understand it, in the last couple of weeks. So it's letting that crop to nest properly and not trying to interfere and control that situation to take the crop before it's actually ready to harvest. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's just a big point. And obviously sterilising the seed is, is a no-brainer again, because you're just stopping all that biological interaction. Endophytes give us an awful lot. Um, and it's, it's I know I'm drifting off fungi here a bit, but it is... I do an awful lot to, to, to sort of get away from using fungicides and to get my nitrogen usage really low, but it's, it's the whole jigsaw. It's not just one piece and fungi are a big part of it, but I have to just touch on everything else because it all sort of comes together and I can't farm without taking, you know, we're taking one piece away. So endophytes are a massive problem. Uh, I haven't got time to talk about endophytes too much tonight, but they they do everything for us endophytes are our best friend um, and the plant is always in control uh, of the whole biosphere in in the uh, in the field and it's the plant that's improving the soil it's the plant that's controlling this bacteria to get the nutrition it wants but the same thing happens with, with fungi as well they can become endophytes as well so it's it's just working again i know i keep repeating but it is working with nature this system was already in place it's us that's that's caused the problems so this is just a, a trial I did a few years back at the time. I couldn't get new seed undressed, so I always had to have it dressed, even though I asked it not to be dressed with seed dressing. 
And this was drilled on the same day, with the same seeds per square meter. The, the slide to the right here was my home safe seed with the biological dressing. And the seeds to the left here were, were bought in seeds with the same biological dressing, but they just couldn't function because I'd got that, that seed dressing on there, stopping that interaction with the, with the biology within the soil. And this was a good 10 days earlier emergence. And you could see that line right the way through the winter. Uh, and it just shows the power of working with nature and, and you know, the, what, how you can inhibit nature by, by putting on these synthetic um, nasties, as I call them. Um, it, it, just, just the way I farm now, I'm not organic, but I do try to farm with nature as much as possible and just using nutrition and biology to do the job for me, which we haven't got all the answers yet. We know so little, but biology has got all the answers. It's, uh, it's a no brainer for us not to be using it. Mycorrhizal fungi, which is one of the things we're here tonight for. Um, and I love mycorrhizal fungi. It's, it's been around for millions of years. Um, I won't insult your intelligence by reading all this slide out because I'm sure you've read it already. But the biggest one, 2,000 square miles. I mean, it's just an amazing thing that this could. This is a living entity that feeds plants. It moves water across that period. It releases nutrition from different parts of the field. If a plant's being attacked, that mycorrhizal fungi network will let plants know that that particular plant is being attacked. So they'll straight away put their immune system into gear. It's it was so it's just an intelligent thing down there and, and we've just took it for granted or i have anyway over the last week before i got really nerdy and interested in soil because i want to know everything about it now and soil is such a fan, fascinating thing um and I'd, I'd recommend everybody to get a microscope and just have a look at their soil and get to know it have a look it's a different world down there um but unfortunately you do need a microscope to be able to see everything and it's just a, a fantastic thing but mycorrhizal fungi has got so many answers and all that nutrition that that mycorrhizal fungi will be releasing it or put it into into glues with the glomalin so it's held there for, for decades ready for that plant when it wants it or whatever plants come in but it's safe it's not going to be leaching off our fields and going into our waterways and killing this planet in which we live there is no planet b we've all got to look after it and we've all got to be responsible for it and to use food production as an excuse to keep destroying it is just not an excuse anymore we, We've got the knowledge now to farm in a way where we can heal the planet in which we live. I do get passionate about this subject, so please bear with me. My fungal, my fungal, my soils now are about, my best field is about 1.6 to 1 fungi to bacteria ratio. The average would be about 1 to 1, which is what I'm after. Um, I know this micro, micro, microbiome, I can't even say it, the microbe test kit. The microbiome kit, it, it's not 100% accurate, but nothing is. A microscope isn't 100% because we're only looking at a tiny bit, but it just lets me manage and, and see patterns and see how that field's changing. Um, and I have some problems trying to establish all seed rape now down some hedgeways because they're just so fungal that the all seed rape's just in the wrong environment. So I just have to look at crops to be able to grow and take that forward, but I, I certainly wouldn't want to go backwards. But it's just a good indicator just to let you know what your soil's doing and where you are. Again, I'm drifting a little bit off topic. I know we're here for fungi, but it is the whole jigsaw coming together and fungi is a big part of it, but we're also here for the pest management and everybody you know, has always talks about flea beetle and the problems they have. And from my experience and knowledge, the only time you're gonna get a flea beetle problem is if you've got available sugar in that plant. So it's monosaccharoids, monofructose that's sitting in that plant and is not being utilized. As long as the plant has got magnesium, sulfur, molybdenum, and boron, it's going to transform those sugars into polysaccharides and polyfructose and that will go down as exudates from the plant roots to feed the biology so that plant isn't full of sugar so it's not like a great big neon sign saying cafe open come and get me it's a healthy plant it's functioning we're all farmers of light um, and by by giving the plant the right nutrition it can it can utilize that nitrogen that's, uh, that's available and the plant isn't exposed to, to, to pest attack and that's how I managed this year, my oilseed rape, the spring barley before I drilled it, which was only two days, was absolutely crawling with flea beetle. Um, and the student I'd got, he said, you must be mad to drill into that. And I have to explain this process to him, which is what he's here was here for. And he was amazed that we just didn't have any problems. We had a little bit of nibbling here and there, but it's just working with nature. And once you understand why those pests are coming in, and it's the same with aphids, they're just nature's bin men. They're coming in to take an unhealthy plant out. And it's, it's just too many people look at the 
the end result of aphids and, and, and rather than looking at the cause so they're, they're looking at the, the how it materializes i forgot the word i want to say but rather than looking at the cause of why those aphids are going in and this is the reason why aphids are going in they're going in because the sugar available the aphids can see that a mile off so it's just just that big sign saying cafe open come on in and feed um, and then we go in trying to solve that problem rather than looking at the cause so we're always looking at the symptom that's the word i was looking for we're always spending too much time looking at the symptom rather than the cause and by doing this to say I've, I've never had a problem growing all seed row or or needed to use um insecticides on on wheat or barley for, for barley yellow wolf drivers so it's just i think i've already touched on that but it's just those exudates going out to feed the bacteria to feed the fungi and keep that whole process working and that's the way nature intended it you know it's just just photosynthesis it's harvesting that light but if we've got that plant full of nitrogen the plant just shuts down. I do a lot of uh, bricks readings with a refractometer to monitor that plant. Um, and I get bricks readings of, of sort of 18, 20, 22. Uh, if you've got that plant full of nitrogen, you'll be straight the way down to sixes and sevens because that plant just isn't functioning. It's full of nitrate and it's just not photosynthesizing. And again, I've, I've touched on this, but it's always farmers that have caused the problem in the first place, which is why the, the aphids or, or the or the or flea beetle are coming in um it, it it's just working with nature and keeping that plant balanced and i know i keep saying that but it's as simple as that that's all it is so i do an awful lot of sap testing to make sure that plant is is balanced um so i'll take old leaves and new leaves by doing that i can see what's going to happen to that plant nutritionally moving forward um, and I can counteract it before there's a problem. If I took um, um, just a, a leaf test, just a plant matter test, it would tell me what's happened and where the plant is. But by doing a sap test, I can look what, look at what's going to likely to happen to that plant going forward, because I can start to see deficiencies in that plant, and I can uh, I can counteract it with foliar treatments. Foliar treatments are so much more effective soil applied you know they're seven times more effective than soil applied and i'm not polluting the planet by doing it the plant is taking it all in quickly i'm covering a lot of ground here so excuse me if i'm swapping about a bit but i'm just trying to get as much in as i can while i while i've got the, the time um but so tissue um, sap testing is for me is just a bit more information than doing a tissue test that's what i'm trying to say and i can see what's likely to happen because Biology is a fickle thing, and same same with fungi in my mind. If we get too dry and too cold, it all stops working. But I'm, you know, I've got to stay in business. I'm a farmer. I'm trying to make money. At the end of the day, if we're not profitable, we can't do anything. So it's it's got to be the number one priority. So that's when I step in and I'll start doing foliar treatments to keep the plant balanced. So I'm not going to get a disease or a pest attack. Um, but it is all down to nutrition. Obviously now, because I've stopped using um, insecticides, I get a lot more caribid beetles. So if I did have a problem with slugs, uh, which I don't, because again, slugs only come in when that plant is producing a polyamide, which again is the perfect food for a slug. As long as the plant isn't producing a polyamide, slugs won't come in. They just It's just the wrong food source and they'll move on. Um, but the one thing, if I do go crop walking for looking for slugs, especially like three or four years ago when I was early on into direct drilling, I just find beetles and it's a beautiful sight when you turn a stone over and you're finding beetles instead of slugs um, the caribid beetle just eats the slug egg so they're there as my guards if i have got it wrong nutritionally they're still there on guard ready to do the job for me and again the natural predators so on this farm in the autumn on the right morning you every field is covered in spiders webs like that so those natural predators are there on guard 24 7 to do the job for me and i I think yeah that's my last slide so i hope i haven't gabbled on too much and not made sense brilliant tim you've not gabbled at all you've given us a huge amount to digest whether that's anaerobically or not but absolutely brilliant i can see questions coming in now as well um and i really liked your your image of that jigsaw of the fungi and the bacteria and the cover crops and, and and them all working together was really nice and really complemented Carl's image of, of um, the biological engine of the earth under there. So all 
fantastic stuff. I'm sure loads of people will have questions. And just to remind people, we will be um, uploading at some stage the PowerPoint presentations of all the speakers. So you will get a chance because there's a lot to take in today. So don't worry, you're not going to miss out. I think I will leave all the questions for the end, actually. So we'll go straight to our final speaker, Dave. Uh, Dave Chandler is a microbiologist and entomologist at the University of Warwick at their crop center. And Dave works in scientific research on insect pests, microbial pest control, also bee health. Uh, but also he touches quite a bit on the broader policy aspects of biopesticide regulation, IPM. And Dave is going to share experiences from developing fungal basal size and implementing that, working with farmers and agronomists on farm to get these products working effectively as part of an IPM strategy. So shall I just jump in? I think so, Dave. I think yeah. Stephanie's uh, internet is still a bit dodgy. So over to you. have got to her. Right. So can you see that OK? Hopefully you can see my screen. Is that yeah, right? That, yeah, yeah that, that's perfect, Dave. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Dave Chandler. I'm at entomologist and uh, microbiologist and originally studied insect diseases and I work on kind of bioprotectants for IPM so I'm going to talk about um, fungal pathogens of arthropods for a bit and I'll talk about um, fungal antagonists of plant diseases I guess uh, the key message is there natural capital isn't it and and these fungal antagonists and fungal pathogens are common in nature and they do two things first of all they can um, contribute to um, natural control of pests and diseases in conservation biocontrollers we've been hearing about but you can some of them you can also mass produce and companies mass produce them and, and sell them as bioprotectant products so on the right we have our ipm pyramid and um, our conservation biological control with fungi will be down here on, on, on the bottom right. And then our um, um, fungal pathogens and antagonists will be near the top of the, um, the pyramid on our biological control bit. So kind of complementary mechanisms. And the IPM thing is, is absolutely criti critical because, you know, the, the, the way to achieve sustainable crop protection is to recognise that there are no single silver bullets. And it's all about integrating things understanding how they integrate and, and relying on the system as a whole as we've been hearing about so i'll start off with we're talking a bit about insect pathogenic fungi i've got two pictures here from on the left and um, i guess globally there are over a thousand species of fungi which have evolved to to kill arthropods that's insects and mites and and as a as a group they kill a wide range of insects but within that that group you get different species and also strains within species and they all have their own particular host ranges so you'll get some of these fungi which have got a very very broad range and you get other um, species and strains within species which have very narrow ranges and so in terms of biological control our, our challenge is really to identify um, the ones which are most compatible for you for use with other natural enemies and biological control agents as part of the IPM and IFM system. So these these are fungi that kill insects. There's two broad groups. Uh, one called the Entomopterales, which is um, an example here on this top. I'm not going to do my impression. Well, I'm going to do my impression of a classic dead fly. So this is a, a fly that's been killed by uh, one of these fungi. This one's called Entomoptera musky. And um, these things you can't mass produce them. They're difficult to grow, um, but they are. Um, natural regulators of insect populations and they do cause natural disease outbreaks particularly in the summer and um, so on aphid pests and fly pests you'll see these we call them epizootics which is just an epidemic in an animal population and you'll see these kind of moving through populations and um, the second group which is a larger group are the ascomycete so i've just chosen two different flies here this is cabbage root fly it's been infected by uh, an ascomycete fungus called metarhizium which is produced 
produces green spores you can see covering the, the, the body. So the, the entomophrales live above ground. The, the ascomycetes naturally occur below ground and they function to kill insects, but they also interact with plants so they can grow as endophytes and in the rhizosphere. And there's evidence to show that one of their functions is to transfer nitrogen to plants by killing insects and transferring the nitrogen from the body of the insect into the plant. These can be mass produced and they're sold as commercial bioprotectants or biopesticides and um, predominantly for use in horticulture. So in the UK, we've got four products available at the moment. There are another five in the pipeline. Globally, there are about 200 products available um, for, for use as bioinsecticides. Um, both groups of fungi work in the same way. So they produce spores, which have got contact action. So they um, can be sprayed or um, in nature, they're actively discharged in some cases and they land on the body of the insect. They, they stick to it, they germinate, they grow inside, overcome the immune system of the insect and kill it and then and reproduce. And this is what you see in the bottom. You see a, a fly that's been killed by metrorhizium by a few uh, small number of spores and then it's killed it and then grown out from the body and is sporulating. Um, so just concentrating on the, the kind of the conservation biocontrol aspects of it. So these insect pathogenic fungi are part of the natural enemy complex. This is data from work we did a few years ago, looking at the ability of natural enemies to control aphid populations on Brassica. This is Brussels sprouts, where we were looking at uh, population dynamics on sequentially planted Brussels sprouts plots. And it's basically a population dynamic curve. So the 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 um, one at the top, the line at the top, that's um, a graph showing the change in the population of aphids over time during the season. And you see what you see is you see an increase in the population you expect, but then you see this kind of catastrophic decline um, towards the end of the summer, a slight resurgence. And that decline is caused by the action of natural enemies. And this big line at the bottom, that's a population of natural enemies, which lags a little bit behind the aphid population. And the main natural enemies, uh, hoverflies, parasitoids, and a fungus called Pandora neoaphidis, one of these entomophthalian fungi, which you can see in the, in, in the picture on the, the top right. Um, this is a slide about uh, use of these insect pathogenic fungi as commercial bioprotectants. This is work we did some while ago on, um, on tomato crops. And I was talking about IPM. These kind of fungal uh, bioprotectants work really well in IPM programs where you can use them as supplements to primary biological control with parasitoids or, or predators. So in this case, we developed a system to use a fungal product based on a species called Bavaria bassiana. And um, that's available commercially. And we showed that it works really well for the control of spider mites. So um, on tomato, there are always occasions mid season where control of spider mite with predatory phytomite starts to, to decline because the population increase in the spider mites outstrips the ability of the predator to control it. And in that situation, in the old days, you used to come in with a synthetic chemical pesticide, but actually if you substitute that and use the, the fungal pathogen, it works much better. The control is improved. And in this case, this particular fungal pathogen, it's completely compatible with the use of natural enemies. Moving on to the microbial biofungicide. So previous speakers already touched on this. You know, this is just a, a range of the products which are available for use to control of fungal diseases. So for botrytis, we have things like gliocladium, which is available as a um, product pre-stop. Um, that's a really rapidly grown fungus. So it actually colonizes plant surfaces and can act as a mycoparasite and can be really effective at preventing botrytis infection. You know, the big one is not a fungus. You know, it's a Bacillus amylo liquefaciens, which is very effective um, bacteria that produces a lipopeptide, which has kind of got uh, fungicidal activity. Powdery mildew, there's a product available called Amplomyces quiz qualis, available as a product called AQ10. That's an obligate mycoparasite. So timing is critical for the use of that. It's used on things like um, um, cucumbers for control of powdery mildew there. 
but it won't survive in the absence of its host. So you've got a very short window of opportunity to apply it when, when the pathogen is the, the first in the crop. And in the soil, if you've been hearing about that, you know, you've got a range of preventatives for soil-borne diseases. The best known is trichoderma, such as T34. That has multiple nodes of action and again, can be really successful as a biofungicide. Um, the multiple modes of action thing, I think, is to me is absolutely fascinating, you know, rather than having a, a chemical agent, a synthetic chemical agent as a single mode of action. You've got these uh, fungal natural enemies which do multiple things. Um, and in addition to acting directly on your, um, in the case of the biofungicides, on your, your target plant pathogen, they can also act as um, plant growth promoters by interacting with the plant. They can turn on um, the natural defences of the, the plant against pests and diseases. So you've got this kind of multiplicity of actions, which in theory and in principle creates a kind of a more robust um, situation. But as I said, they, the most important thing to emphasize is their use is an integrated pest and disease and an integrated farm management network system. So, so when you're using these commercial biofungicides, they work best for, for low to moderate disease levels. They use predominantly as of commercial products in horticulture, and it's well established now that they can really help significantly reduce applications of conventional fungicides in kind of conventional horticultural production. Um, we've been doing a lot of work through HDB horticulture uh, funded research program with colleagues at ADAS and, and, and Silso and some consultants as well to work with um, growers in the horticultural sector to develop ways of um, helping growers get the best out of these new bioprotectants coming through because they are new products. They require more knowledge to use them effectively and they do require kind of um, increased investment in kind of skill so we've been, been been working with with growers to try and improve their capabilities to adopt bioprotectants looking at things like improved spray application studying things like the persistence of these bioprotectants on the crop developing new pest population models that allow us to target um, the effective application of these new um, generation of products coming through. Um, this is kind of a slide to, to kind of express how I see some of the future and it's linked to this idea about using these as part of a system. So we've been doing work with colleagues to look at integrating biological controls with partial host plant resistance. So most of the plant breeding programs so far have always focused on things like single dominant gene resistance to plant pathogens and also to insects. And that's great as far as it goes, but the problem is that single dominant gene resistance is short lived and it will inevitably break down. And um, so if you go for partial resistance, which is under multi gene control, you've got a more robust system and, and really the trick going forward is to understand how you can interact that partial host plant resistance with forms of bio control. So we've been working on partial host plant resistance in brassicas combined with insect pathogenic fungi. You see there on the bottom left against uh, mysis and against cabbage aphid. And we've shown in some situations you have positive interactions. And in fact, the host plant resistance can act as a kind of an enabler and it makes aphids um, significantly more susceptible to these fungal pathogens compared to, to use on susceptible plants. So, so looking forward to the, the, the future, you know, we, we're at the start of this new, hopefully sustainable green revolution where, you know, we, we start to, to produce food in ways that actually enhance the planet and, and protect biodiversity and re regenerate our soils. And, and that's reflected in things like the, the UN Biodiversity COP aspiration to reduce pesticide use by two thirds within eight years. And hopefully as, a, as, as that and other things as drivers, we'll start to see a much wider range of these bioprotectants coming onto the market. But we need how we need the knowledge to use them widely wisely. So we need to use technology to deliver the, 
the, the precision application systems and the decision support that we need. And we also need the ecological knowledge to use them as part of a, of a wider system. I'd like to see much more work to actually conserve and enhance um, the activity of these fungi and to, to, to capitalize on their beneficial properties, both above ground, but also in soils. You know, and finally, these are not silver bullets. You know, they're part of integrated farm um, management. And I think if we, you know, as the previous speaker was saying, if we take the kind of the IF, IFM and IPM route, and I think that the prospects for the future are really, really exciting. Um, so I'll I'll leave it there because of time, and um, you know, obviously join in and and happy to take any questions from people. Yeah, so that's me done. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, again, kept to time and threw an enormous amount of really useful, interesting stuff at us. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, you're sounding good, Stephanie. If you if you stop, I will jump in, but you're sounding good. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So I think what we'll do is we've got half an hour for questions. We've got a lot of questions and the ones I've looked at so far are all really good. So I think I'm going to do a first round which will be to each and let you answer those and then we'll, we might even have time for a, a third round. Uh, so for Carl, your first two, the first one is from Gary Bradbury and he's saying, uh, what about the effects of waterlogging or temporary flooding on beneficial soil fungi? Can they recover quite quickly? Uh, so that's one, uh, one question for Carl. Um, then mm -hmm. there are two that sort of kind of quite similar are they different fungi and also do do does the do the beneficial fungi increase resilience to all pathogens or just fungal pathogens so carl would you like to okay, have so a go at those two first thanks stephanie so the the effect of water logging um on you're asking for beneficial soil fungi in, in general. We could maybe just address that as, as all fungi because beneficial fungi or pathogenic fungi, it's all a relative term. Um, and most of them have broadly similar um, lifestyles and strategies um, when, they're, when they're growing in the soil there, especially when the environmental circumstances are changing. So um, temporary fungi, so short-term perturbations such as this, um, by the nature of them being temporary means that they have a relatively small effect because remember these organisms have evolved in the context of a changing environment so a bit of flooding here and there they've experienced before on many occasions in, in evolutionary time so it doesn't compromise them too much but extensive or extended periods of waterlogging and so on well yeah then that can start to kick the system down but equally most soil biota um, is inherently pretty resilient because they're they're growing in quite a hostile environment at the end of the day. So there are many, they have many um, survival strategies. So what will happen is they will get kicked down, the populations will decline, but in general, they will recover. And of course, for a beneficial fungus, that's what you want. They're going to recover, that's great. For a, for a pathogen or whatever else, that's less, that's kind of less desirable. Um, so very long term, yeah, but they'll in, in time they will tend to recover. The key thing about that is that the recovery of kind of any biological system will depend on the extent to which it's been compromised, which relates to how long the flooding has been or whatever else, and then the resources it has available in order to aid that recovery. It's just like you know how fit you are before you get COVID, sort of thing. Um, apologies if you, you know, but it's so if you have a, a diverse uh, and an and and integrated system, then it will recover more rapidly, it'll have more resilience than one that's been compromised. So, 
the answer to this question is, you know, the caveat is it depends on the circumstances, the state of the system when this flooding whatever is occurring, and uh, that will influence the rate of recovery. Um, and then the other question was, do fungi increase the resilience to all pathogens or just fungal pathogens? So that's a really complicated question because it it's the dreaded, it depends um, context of whether you are dealing with um, sort of, it's which, it's, it's, so fungi will be influencing different components of the system. So as Tim was mentioning, if you have a strong fungal community that is connecting with the plant community well, then in general terms, that's going to increase the resilience to all pathogens because it'll provide a general level of health. Where you have a specific component, whatever else being compromised, then what you're looking for is we're going more to these specific interactions, you know, for example, like we saw with the, the experiment I showed you with the, the fusarium, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there you might have more one-to-one -one sorts of relationships. And this also maps onto these two strategies for disease control. Do you use a single organism to try and, you know, buy the biocontrol scenario, which works well um, in the in the more controlled horticultural context, or do you try and manage biodiversity in a general sense that will provide, on average, a greater resistance and resilience to all manner of pathogens? So at the so again, it's it's a question of you know it, it spans the whole gamut, but as a precautionary principle, I would pick up entirely on what Tim's been saying, which is what you're looking to do is is manage as many aspects of the system that in combination give you a much more coherent and overall resilience to that. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pick two questions for Tim now. Um, first of all, a very practical one, Tim, from Jenny Phelps. She says, what's the best model of microscope to buy for looking at soil biology on your farm? Uh, she's wanted to buy some for her farmers for some time so any tips on on which model uh, one from Mathieu which is how long does it take you to switch from a conventional agriculture with insecticides with plowing to the system that you've got and and, and whether times during that that adaptation process where you know your yields or your your, your economic bottom line took a dip Um, starting with the, the microscope, the, the most important thing in my mind is to have a camera on it so you can actually look at it on a computer screen and take pictures um, and refer back to it and, and record it, basically. So make, I, I wouldn't be able to, I can't think of one off the top, I can't think of my make off the top of my head, but it's being able to record. I, I've got a couple of microscopes and I didn't have the camera on the first one and that's one thing I really regretted is not being able to video what's going on and and use the technology to record it. So having that camera to me is, is vitally important. Um, in regard to getting your soil working, it depends on where you're starting from really. Um, so it's an how long's a piece of string question, but it's just becoming the observer so as you can actually see what's going on. And I'd recommend anybody starting out on the journey to take pictures of their soil, you know, buy a spade, dig, have a dig and take pictures and see how that color changes, see how that smell changes, just see how that life comes back into the soil. It's a, it's a whole new environment down there. Um, for me, I suppose in 2015, it was, or 16, one of the two, it was a really bad back end for, for BYDV. And then I was just starting out. I hadn't got the knowledge I'd got now. And I did get some BYDV, but mine wasn't as bad as the neighbors who'd sprayed four times. So it just gave me the confidence to carry on on the journey. And I knew I was on the right path and, and I haven't suffered since because I just understand what I'm trying to achieve now, which is, is the biggest thing. Reading books is the most important thing is doing your own research. All the information's out there. It's just getting off your bum and, and finding those books, basically, and, and reading. And it's, uh, it's, it's, I can't stop reading. I've always got books waiting to be read. It's, um, it's just one of those things. So I don't know whether I've answered the question there, but. It's starting the journey and starting to understand and just seeing how things are changing. But that initial jump of not using an insecticide, it is a scary one, but 
you've just got to monitor it and see what's going on in the crop. Um, I wouldn't want anybody to, to lose their crop because the, the plant wasn't functioning. So it's monitoring and being prepared to jump in if it all goes wrong. That's all I'd say. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, moving to Dave. Uh, we have a question for you, Dave, from Howard, and it's about powdery mildew on uh, pot roses. So Howard says, you mentioned that the timing of that product AQ10 is really, really important. And he says he still has issues with powdery mildew on, on pot roses. They do use um, AQ10 as part of a rotation. So what should be the timing, thinking that this is a 10 week crop and he only seems to get mildew at the end when the canopy is closing in? So the AQ... Share some thoughts to, to answer that. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the AQ10, it's an obligate uh, mycoparasite, so it needs to have its powdery mildew host present in order to survive, and it will only survive for three days or less on the plant in the absence of powdery mildew. So... Um, if you apply it when there's no powdery mildew around, it will die off. And if you apply it when there's too much powdery mildew around, then it just gets overtaken by the powdery mildew. So you, the, the recommendations are that you apply it in that very narrow window when you first see kind of powdery mildew. So that, that's kind of the best recommend, recommendation I can make for it howard i think the other thing is to kind of check that you're having separate tanks for your uh bioprotectants and your conventionals because you don't want any residue hanging over and um, and we've seen that in the past and um, you can get residue in a tank and that can kind of destroy your bioprotectant um so we kind of recommend people have have separate tanks watch your water what you're, you're mixing and I think the other key thing is with these bioprotectants you've got to be spot on with your application they require you know in a horticultural set, uh, setting they require precision application because you want to get the maximum amount of the material um, in terms of spores per unit area onto the crop and that generally means using the lowest available water volume um, if it's a product which is applied at a, a constant dose and as, again this is one of the issues we've, we're finding because uh, the water volume recommendations are generally too high and they can be up to kind of 1500 litres per hectare which is kind of massive and and really you want to have as low a water volume as you can within the, the label recommendations and then I guess when you're using it keep an eye on it and and if if you feel your control is not working then you'll need to come in with a conventional fungicide spray is that hopefully does that answer your questions yeah sums up brilliant great thanks dave um i'm going to throw another one quick one back at tim it's a question from charlotte uh please can we have a list of the microorganisms you brew please um just whilst tim's thinking about that we will be having a case study from Tim that we publish on Um but Tim, I don't know. Maybe it's a maybe it's a proprietary secret, and and we, we, I don't know. Um, any any thoughts that you you can help in explaining that, or give you a bit more website or something like that would be good. I have got a list somewhere, but I I just can't find it, so uh, I'd have to come back to you on that one. Okay, I think we can do that. We can, we can, we can. Um, yeah. If you if you whiz us something at some stage, Tim, then we we can make sure people uh, can have access to that. I'm going to uh, take another question for Carl, um, and it's from Atalo, our colleague in Ethiopia. And he says, so he's talking about the Ethiopian context, he says he has seen farmers drenching seeds with a mix of farm soil and cow urine. 
And those farmers told him that they were vaccinating the seeds to make them immune from fungal disease. How do you think that works? And why were they using the farm soil where the seeds were going to be sown? I guess because maybe there were some problems with that soil. Um, okay, well, what a, what a, what a great question. Um, my, my first answer would be, um, does it work? So uh, you, you, you see these practices going on, but we're, we're not clear. And of course, as a scientist, I'd be very careful and um, forgive me, skeptical until I see proper data and controlled experiments, etc. We have to be very careful around um, folklore and experience uh, versus, you know, proper uh, proper scientific study of these sorts of sorts of contexts. Of course, these sorts of basic observations can provide an excellent framework for scientific investigation. So, you know, but um, certainly need to be taken apart there. Now, the, the principles as to why this might be a good idea are clear in the sense that it goes back to what Tim was saying. If you have a diverse community on your seeds versus a, you know, versus a, a very low diversity in there, then and as I showed from my data, that what that will inevitably do, it means you've got a diverse community that can provide all sorts of functions that you want. And they could be attenuating disease or the entry pathogens there. They could be cycling nutrients in the vicinity of the seed, et cetera, et cetera. So a nice diverse community around that seed will provide a sort of toolbox of all sorts of things that the plant might need. And as my experiment showed you, a diverse community around a seedling is going to resist the invasion from other other fungi or other pathogens um, in there. The concept of using farm soil from where the seeds were going to be sown, well, yeah, that's an interesting one because there you what you might have is the case of that particular soil will have a sort of local range of organisms in there, whereas soil from another farm might have a different range of organisms and therefore, in one sense, is more diverse. So we're already you know, evolving a little experimental program here. And perhaps, you know, those of you who are still in the mix can apply for funding around this. But, you know, what would be more or less effective in these terms? My hypothesis would be, uh, yeah, you know, the more diverse the inoculum um, around that, then the wider range of benefits on average you are likely to see. And again, it's not about specific control of one thing or the other. We're talking about, you know, these diversity effects on average across all circumstances. What I'm finding fascinating from Tim is that, you know, his basic principles there seem to be working and giving him that sort of resilience sort of across the piece now, he's got the, the systems all in place there. And um, probably in early days, you had the occasional trip up where something did get its teeth in there. But if you build up that complexity, you get those networks, that integrated system um, all connected, then you are much more likely to be resilient Thank you, Carl. Um, I would like a question to uh, Dave, if I may, and it's about how we get farmers who are, or agronomists who are advising farmers who are very used to the general predictability of or synthetic fungus. We, we've been hearing all tonight about the huge diversity uh, of of beneficial soil organisms and the natural enemies. We know that every field is different every season, every day, really. And, and kind of working in biocontrol as well, the hat relied on quite a predictable effect to something where the the impact might be less predictable, especially when you're starting off, it's new and you're feeling a bit nervous. I think we lost Stephanie. Um, I think the gist of her question, I mean, I think it was going to Dave, but was that um, sort of how can we get farmers and also agronomists to start kind of adopting these kind of techniques that you've been talking about today. Stephanie, are you back? Am I correct? I think we'll go. I think we'll go with that, Dave. <laughs> oh, we have left the building. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, it's yeah. That's that's really hard to answer, um, because 
it's a it, essentially so i'm not i'm, I'm pausing because i'm thinking it's, it's such a complex question and it is the the hard question how do we get the transition from our current agricultural system focused on industrial production towards a truly sustainable system that delivers us food and enhances um our natural capital and biodiversity at the same time um so you can have i guess two things so so one is you you can do as much as you can in terms of education and making sure that um products are available and advice is is available unfortunately in this i'm going to go into a major rant here because um in, in this country we've turned our back on sustainable agriculture over the last 30 years um and governments of different stripes have just walked away from the importance of sustainable food production so literally the, the research establishment is hanging by a thread where the privatization of adas and we have a system that doesn't um until now reward kind of proper stewardship in, in my opinion so we need to invest in the whole farming network um with a with a single voc focus on producing food in ways that are good for people and 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 for the planet the other thing is if we don't do that we're going to end up with an absolutely massive bloody shock where um the, the, the system will collapse and you we can all see that coming down the track we don't um change the way we're doing things you know there, there are interesting things occurring i mean the, the the biodiversity cop that's going to be held this year in china i mean the the statement there that they want a two-thirds reduction in synthetic chemical pesticide use globally by 2030 i mean that's absolutely massive whether that can be achieved or not i don't know but it, it it's absolutely massive you know the the requirement to massively reduce um, nitrogen pollution from farms into waters and and the eu bless it has, has kind of got targets i mean the uk doesn't but the eu's got targets for, for pesticide reduction i mean i must say i'm not anti-chemical pesticide at all i think they're in the right context if they're used properly then they're they're, they're part of the the toolbox um the thing i'm against is this the single focused industrial approach which has been devastating for biodiversity on the planet so I don't know if that answers your question, but it's it, it, it's a complex thing, isn't it? I mean, I don't know if the other guys want to kind of jump in here. Yeah, I was actually going to say off the back of that, Tim, I'd be really interested because you're obviously sort of doing a lot of this already, but it, it takes farmers like you to kind of take the risk themselves and do the reading themselves and lead the way. So I'd be interested to hear from you kind of what support do you think that other farmers need so we can start kind of mainstreaming some of these techniques? I think the most important thing is that farmers share ideas. It's, we've got to get away from this culture of people wanting to outdo their neighbours and that if we all do trials, we can all share the information, we can all move forward. And it's in farmers' interests and all growers' interests. It doesn't matter if it's horticulture or farming or whatever you want to call it. We're all growers. We're all providing food. We're all growing plants. Um, and if we all share what we're doing, we can all move forward faster. I think chemical companies have had too big a hold on us for too long. And personally, I think herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, all have one thing in common and that's suicide but we're, we're heading we're proving that system doesn't work it's breaking down our soils are in a dilapidated state and we've proved the damage we've done and i agreed with, with what david said they are in the toolbox they are there to get us out of trouble we need to produce food but we need to be looking at, away from those systems they haven't worked and it's time to work with nature work with biology biology's got all the answers in my mind we just haven't asked the right questions yet it's we're right at the tip of the iceberg it's such an exciting time to be involved in production because we're moving into a new era where we're going to be healing the planet we're not going to be keep killing it we, you know there is no planet b this is all we've got and we've all it's up to every individual to stand up and demand that we start to look after the planet and regard whoever asked the question, you know, the change, I always look to it. It's it's like swimming across a river and you get halfway across and you're getting tired and you start to look back at that bank thinking, oh, should I just go back and give this up? And just don't look back, keep focused on where you want to get to and where, you, where you're pushing to get to, because that's what it's all about. And there's enough support out there. We, if we all help one another, we can get there and we can get to where we all need to be and be in a sustainable, profitable business rather than, wondering where, whether we're going to be in business the year after. 
I think I was going to just jump in and add to that because I think the things I've I've seen is now that there is there's no kind of dispute about what the common purpose should be. You know, the the, the poor state of the planet is is indisputable. It's it's recognised and everyone knows that we have to move towards a a truly sustainable system, which is a huge challenge, but we know we have to achieve it. You know, when I first started in my career, I first started 30 years ago and I was working on organic farms. And, um, you know, they were seen as a, a, almost a fringe activity. Now, now it's recognised that the ecological principles, which um, organic farming was, was pioneering, is central for the whole of the farming system. So, so attitudes have changed they need they need to go further and there needs to be full recognition from from government in terms of developing policies that enable sustainable robust resilient nature friendly farming systems to go into effect where you get proper consideration of food production and protecting nature i think that, that that's critical you know government policy sets the tone and that's the thing we need to put lots of pressure on I, I would i would agree with all of that but the thing i would the things i pick up most on are that we kind of know now how to fix these things and people like tim are demonstrably making that work so the key here then is for leaders like tim and visionaries like Tim to be communicating to their peer group. Dave and I, you know, we're scientists. We we have that argot and stuff. But Tim is, you know, is an exemplar. And what we need is events like this evening and so on. It's all about communication, and it's about communication across the piece, so that you know. Um, and th I don't see that being enabled particularly um, by government policy, etc. You know, they, that's that's the missing link, and there is a vast opportunity for, you know, if we could scale up the degree of communication that and, and and showing that these things can go on, that could be the difference. That's a research grant or that's an enabling grant that I would like to see um, being funded. I can't see that going through the current grant infrastructure mode at all. You know, um, because people are still locked into these old old models that you know that Dave and I we have that heritage and stuff, but this is the this is where online communication etc cetera, etc cetera, could make the difference um so full full credit to tim for, for for his vision and for and and you know please communicate more and more or again you know uh, people have ideas as to how we might amplify this you know pan is a is one of a number of these initiatives but there's they're few and far between you know i'd like to be speaking on a webinar every night for the next 10 years um from all these different sources for an hour you know um brilliant i think carl that <laughs> that that's probably a a good point to 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 wrap up um i think we agree with everything it's been absolutely fantastic i'd really like to thank our three speakers you you've informed us you, you've excited and inspired us i think um, you've pitched it just right. You know, there can be a lot of technical science terms, but you explained it really well. Um, thanks really to Josie for <laughs> leaping in with my uh, dreadful internet connection. Um, and it's been great to have such an international audience. We've had people from Latin America as well, um, because, you know, this isn't just about British farming. That I think the principles are uh, global and actually many countries I think are more ahead of us in some ways than you know Britain's got a lot to learn from elsewhere. Um, we will have a fourth webinar in this series and it will be all about IPM in horticulture. It will be sometime in March, we don't have a date yet but uh, everyone who registered tonight will get an email invite when that uh, date is fixed. So look forward to that. Um, I've learned a huge amount um, at Pan UK. We are always interested to hear good stories, ex successful experiences about moving away from reliance on pesticides and, and moving to a more agroecological approach. So anybody who's on the, uh, the webinar tonight who'd like to share some good stories, uh, please get in contact with us. We'd love to uh, hear about them and publish them in our newsletter. And I would just like to, finish by recommending a fantastic book 
which I've really enjoyed. I'm sure many of you have been watching it too. I probably won't do it, but it's, I'll put it in the chat. It's Merlin Sheldrake's book called Entangled Life. He is a mycologist, someone who studies fungi, and this book is just brilliant. It just tells you about how fungi, uh, kind of almost at the basis of every aspect of our life on, on, on this planet. There's a bit about pest management in there as well, disease management, and it's just brilliant. I really recommend it. I'll put that in the chat. And um, thank you so much, for everybody, for attending. I hope you got as much out of it as we did. Thanks again to our speakers. And uh, this is an ongoing project, a community for change. So um, forward and upwards with the fungi. Thank you.